How we doing? I'm still at work. Uh, I just finished watching uh, A Haunting in Venice, which is the third in the uh, in Brana's series of Piro films. Piro, Piro, one of them. You say tomato, I say tomato. Uh, this one um, is based on Agatha Christie's 1969 novel A Halloween Party. Uh, the novel was set in it was you know was set in London, not in in Venice, but here we are. Uh, I really liked the first one. I really liked, um, uh, Murder on the Orient Express. And one of the big reasons for it was you had a lot of different actors giving pretty strong, um, character actor performances who are usually bigger name actors and leads and things. Um, the second one, not as crazy about, uh, you know, you got Wonder Woman, you have Arnie Hammer, which... They couldn't kind of they couldn't Christopher Plummer him like in All the Money in the World or, or uh, uh, Tig Navarro in Army of the Dead where they could just swap out a character uh, with two digital effects. Um, my favorite thing about uh, Murder on the Orient Express is when we had it at the Wayne Theater, um, a woman came to see it and she threw up and she told me that she had an irrational fear of mustaches and I was like, and you're coming to see a Puro film like the fuck, uh, but. This one, um, stylistically, is the most interesting of the three. Uh, he does something really cool with um, with his camera and with his blocking and framing. Um, there's a, almost a uh, a claustrophobic, uh, lamp lit feeling to everything, um, which has a weird glow to it. Uh, there's a lot of like carrot scenes. Uh, you know, there's a lot of takes where there's a lot of headroom on one side of the actors and the other one is very close up um, and or, you know, a character is directly to the left of the frame and the other ones. There's just a lot of neat camera work in the movie. Um, I like the score as well. I love the Halloween setting. Obviously, um, the movie is without giving anything away. The movie is about Piro living in uh, in Venice. Uh, it's uh, 1947. So it's after World War Two. And he is uh, kind of still haunted by things that he's seen in his past. Later in the movie, they say that he's basically a black cloud in people's lives that attracts death. Um, and uh, so he's trying to kind of live off the grid. But people know who he is. And he has to get a bodyguard because people are constantly coming to him to try to solve their mysteries. Um, and uh, uh, Tina Fey's character, Tina Fey from 30 Rock and wrote Mean Girls. Um, she's actually from... This area where this theater I'm in right now is. Uh, this is a very non-comedic but still comedic role for her. She's playing a, a mystery uh, writer who's very Agatha Christie-esque, um, who basically uh, is the one who created the legend of Pirro. Um, and she hasn't. Ha she's had a couple books in a row that were flops. And she comes to her friend and she's like, "Hey, you know, like you don't believe in God anymore, and you, there, everything is broken and terrible. Let me take you to something." which is bigger than you, that you can't, uh, you know, that you can't say that you've seen before. And, and it's to a seance. And the seance is at this uh, former children's school that uh, I guess a, a plague broke out in. And they basically locked the kids in and left them to die. So it's a very superstitious element to the movie of people who think that the place is haunted and they refuse to go there. So this woman who used to be a opera singer um, has bought it, but it's falling apart. Um, and years before that, her daughter had committed suicide. Um, she fell in love with a man and uh, things became very, very serious. And then all of a sudden she came out with madness and uh, she had to be cared for day and night by her mother and by a very, very religious uh, housekeeper, basically. Um, and then the, uh, the, the fiance, they, they tried to pin it on him that, um, she didn't have enough money and that's why he left her. So they go on Halloween night to this big Halloween party, uh, that they're throwing at this former school. Um, and, uh, you know, it's the little things in life, like, uh, bobbing for apples. Um, Piro says, I have no, you know, I have no, nothing in me for games and whatnot. Um, and so they go and then there's a seance. That happens after that, where they're trying to reach the. Can I leave the light on up there? No. Okay, I thought I left the projector light on. Um, or is it a ghost? Like my hat, Ghostbuster, spooky. Um, they, where they um, they're gonna try to 
get in touch with the daughter who committed suicide because the mother doesn't believe that she committed suicide. And that's when Michelle Yeoh comes into the movie, uh, coming off her Academy Award for Everything Everywhere All at Once. And she plays the um, the medium. I think there's not enough of her in the movie. And that's one of the things, one of my biggest complaints about this movie is um, story-wise, the script is not as strong as the last two. And this one lacks uh, the star power of the, those movies. They're, everyone in this, I've kind of, I've seen them in other things, but they're not a, like, you know, they're not a Johnny Depp or a Ridley, uh, a Rid- D- Daisy Ridley or somebody like that from the other ones or uh, Gal Gadot or even Arnie Hammer. Um, and because uh, even like you look at the last two, um, uh, Knives Out and The Glass Onion, which are very Agatha Christie style of uh, storytelling, those just have star-studded casts. Um, this one lacks that kind of punch. Um, and then it also, the script just isn't as strong as the first one. Um, I think it's better than the second one, though. Um, there's just, I don't know, there's, there just seemed to be something not all the way there, but I still liked it. Um, I like that uh, that um, Tina Fey is very much playing like an intrepid reporter, and it, she, her and Piro's uh, bouncing off each other is almost vaudevillian in a lot of parts, where there's a lot of sing-song style dialogue um, that's delivered between the two of them very quickly. Um, the, the look of the man, the the house that they're in is great. It, it works as another character in its own. Um, there are like some little jump scares. Apparently, uh, Brana worked with the production crew to uh, have you know doors open and shut and and wind and whatnot happen without the actors knowing, so that they could get an honest reaction out of them. Uh, sort of like uh, I mean, well, Kubrick basically mentally abused Shelley Long for the the Shining, and Argento would blast at certain times Goblin music for the making of um, Suspiria, so a little something like that. But I think stylistically, this is his most interesting of these three movies. Um, I, I I like his performance in this one. I like that he is a very different Piro than the last two. Uh, I also like that in this one, we don't need a whole subplot about where his mustache came from, like in the second one. It's like, what the fuck? Um, uh, again, and anything with a Halloween setting um, is is always very interesting to me. Uh, and almost a death by bobbing for apples. You don't see that very often. Um, but, uh, you know, for the most part, it was a fine watch. But if you're going into it thinking that it's a horror movie, you're wrong. It's it's a psychological thriller, basically. Um, it does have a supernatural element, which, um, you know, you could take it one way or the other based on the uh, when the the mystery is, is uh, you know, rolled out there are parts of it that i saw coming from a mile away and again it's, this is different than the 69 uh uh ha- halloween parties book which i know i read in high school um but i i didn't remember much of this stuff i, I just remembered i was like okay wait i know what year it came out i know where it was set i know the general concept of it but there's other when you get to the resolution even though it was done first in the book you're going to draw comparisons to things like The Sixth Sense uh, in there. Um, I like the little kid who's in it. He's very uh, interesting. I thought his performance was really strong. I thought it was very... Again, everyone is very sharp in this. Um, and when you find out like some of the characters' backstories, like the the boy's father is the, um, is the doctor... Uh, who they trust the the mother the you know the the opera singer trusted and uh, he has PTSD from World War II from uh, liberating concentration camps so you, you you'll see that like he's making a lot of mistakes and everyone has their own ghosts like I was saying in this so it's it's interesting in that way um, I do like that these films are um, they're doing well and they're gonna keep they could keep making them because obviously Agatha Christie has a, a lot of these novels. Um, but I like a good whodunit. I like a good mystery. Um, I like a movie where you have to actually pay attention and kind of pick the pieces up as you go. And then if something is revealed that you maybe didn't see, you go, it makes you re- think back about that scene again. Um, but again, I guess its biggest thing is just the script is a little bit softer. Um, the, and the, uh, the cast is not quite there 
where the other ones were. But for the most part, I, I thought this was really fun. I mean, not fun, but like it was a good watch. Enough for me to stay after work by myself and watch it. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. Um, what is your favorite mystery movie? Are you going to check this one out? Uh, you know, what do you think of Kenneth Branagh? Uh, um, uh, he made the first Thor. The, that I kind of wish those movies would go back to being like the first movie. Um, he also made uh, Frankenstein, where like half the time he's shirtless, and you could just cut the first hour of that movie out, and it would be a way better movie. Um, just shirtless, rolling around in embryonic fluid. Um, yeah, I don't know. I like Brian. He's supposed to be doing a Gargoyles movie based on the Disney cartoon. Be interesting to see if they do that. And if they do, they better get David Keith to come back and do the voice of like the main one. I think uh, Jonathan Frakes and as a fly in here, Jonathan Frakes and uh, Marina Sirtis, I believe, were also voices in that cartoon. I remember watching it when I was in middle school. I think when it came out and liking it, uh, but I read that Brana was supposed to be directing that, so that that could be kind of cool. Um, dude's a great actor. He's a good good director. Um, I think this script could have used one more pass, and I think we could have used a little bit more pop in the uh, the the performances. Um, but again, Michelle Yeoh is always great. I just wish that there was more of her in this movie. Um, she plays uh, this this uh, medium with a lot of different shades uh, than you would expect because she has some scenes where she's playing it one way and some scenes with playing another way, but it all works together, which I, I, I really liked. And again, there's some cool, weird kind of um, nightmare imagery and, and a weird uncomfortableness with how he, he uses his camera and um, in the editing and stuff. So for that matter, I, I enjoyed it. Um, not as good as Murder on the Orient Express, but I thought way better than Death on the Nile. Um, and this movie doesn't have any wannabe cannibals in it like Arnie Hammer in that last one. Uh, but yeah, let me know what you thought if you guys check it out. Um, I don't even know what's coming out, and I'm the ha one who handles all the bookings for movies. Uh, I think Expendables 4, but I never saw Expendables 3, so we'll see. We'll see what's coming out to check out, and um, yeah, bye.